And um, let me give the first health warning of the day. There's a broken glass here, so anyone who walks past, please uh, don't uh, tread in the glass. It could be very dangerous. Good morning, everybody. Uh, what an interesting time to be alive and to be in the OTC industry. Now, as many of you will know, because there are a lot of people here who've been to our conference many times, we start with a little family tradition of getting to know each other. And um, it's, it's really good. The only problem is it goes on for too long. And we do absolutely have to um, start the live streaming at 8.30. So we're just going to have five minutes of getting to know each other. So what we do is, first of all, I ask anyone who has come from outside of region Europe to stand up. Anyone from outside of region Europe. And can we greet these foreigners? <laughs> and we love you very much, but please sit down. <clears throat> Now can I ask anybody for whom this is your first Nicholas Hall conference, please to stand up. And can we greet you? <laughs> now would everyone stand up? <laughs> and here's the little family party trick we, we perform. We want everybody to greet the person left, right, behind, and in front, and you have five minutes to make new friends. Please go. Can I please ask you now to stop making friends, to take your seat. Uh, in a moment we will go live, but just to...
again, everybody. And let's look at what's happened to the OTC industry since many of us met last year in the beautiful city of Munich. So you'll remember, or those of you here will remember, in April 2017, I posed the challenge, are we looking in the right place for growth? And these, this is the slide that I ended last year's meeting with. If we think of this market as pharmacy plus, then we're looking in the wrong place. The market is already bigger than the pharmacy plus market, which we measure at about 185 billion uh, US dollars. I, this should be in euros. The rest of the presentation, I promise you, is in euros. Um, it's already 50% uh, bigger than that if we think in terms of multi-level, if we think in terms of e-commerce, if we think in terms of convenience and other non-traditional outlets for consumer health. So in that sense, the market is probably already about 300, or will be 300, the wider definition, the current rate of growth was slightly ahead. Um, we ended up by saying, we didn't call it the new paradigm last year, we had seven factors, but I've slightly changed them this year, so let's call that the new paradigm. A different way of running the, and managing the OTC consumer healthcare market, it could be 450 billion, or just over 400 billion euros, 10% uh, growth rate. Now that's what we said a year ago. What happened in the last year? Well, the first thing is we had our 40th uh, birthday party, so uh, we're, we're very elderly 40-year-old uh, people as a company. So that was good news. Um, other world leaders didn't have such a good year, and for Donald Trump, it was a year of living dangerously, in which um, uh, for those from the United States, your president um, took a very strong line on some things and uh, confused us on many other things. And here we have all the world leaders all looking as though they are um, in some disagreement with the president of the free world. So it was a very exciting world politically. What was it like in the, uh, in the consumer healthcare market? I think it was not a year of living dangerously. I think it was a year of living quietly. So for example, our good friends at Pfizer, the consumer healthcare division was put up for sale. And as far as we know, there is no buyer for that company. Now, you will know that uh, those of you who've seen the internet news this morning that I had to rewrite this slide because I was going to say that Merck has also not found a buyer, but we know as of two hours ago that in fact Procter & Gamble is buying Merck for I think it's, it's um, 3.5 billion euros. So that transaction, it would appear, is going ahead subject to... That's why it's always um, right to observe the, the, uh, the title of the James Bond movie, Never Say Never because as I say, at seven o'clock I was changing this presentation. And I, and I love the fact that in modern technology you can do that. In the old days of 35 millimeter slides, the slides were always out of date by the time you came to give the presentation. But now, we're through the, models, uh, the wonders of modern technology, we can, we can announce the news as it breaks. And I think the reasons, uh, obviously not for Merck, although they clearly did not get the four billion euro that they said they were looking for and was the reason given by Nestle not to buy the business. So the reason, shall we say, that Pfizer didn't attract the buyers we expected, it didn't attract Reckitt Benckiser, it didn't attract Glaxo, and there was even some suspicion that Procter & Gamble might be in there, is I think a function of what we're seeing in the marketplace, uh, which is this. In the, in the year 2017, the consumer healthcare market in value grew at 4.1%. Now, as you can see from the five-year set, that's at the low end. We had our terrific year in 2015. Everything seemed to go well, and we produced 5.4% growth value. That doesn't seem very much, but it was the best for 25 years. So that was a good result. If we look at the CAGA, the compound annual growth rate for this historical period, it's about 4.5%. So you can see that last year we were 10%, 10 basis points below. The, or should I say four basis points below the average. Volume growth was 2.7%. Well, there is some volume growth in the market. We're not going to see that when we look at other regions. Um, when we look at our latest estimate for 2018, it's a little bit better. So we're assuming that there will be some growth from one of the three main drivers of the OTC industry. That's growth in the emerging markets. That's prescription to OTC switch. And it's also having a very good cough and cold season, at least from the point of view of the industry, if not from the point of view of sufferers. 
I've done a lot of work with the investment community in the last year. In fact, uh, we are seeing a lot of private equity investing, hedge funds investing and disinvesting in this category. And I think the reason that uh, Pfizer didn't go to Reckitt Benckiser is because investors, long-term big investors, are looking at this market and have become cautious. They are recognizing issues that perhaps we don't recognize or maybe aren't so important to us as marketeers. They're very concerned about the, the continuing growth of generics. They're very, they're very concerned about the continuing growth of big tech that might divert sales from brands to generics. They're worried about government intervention. And as an ambassador for the industry, I, can, I have an answer to every one of those points, but at the end of the day, it's their money, not mine. And the word was out, this would be a bad deal. The Pfizer acquisition would be a bad deal for Reckitt. And we now know that Glaxo was doing another deal, buying out its minority partner in the consumer healthcare JV, Novartis. So obviously was not going to be in the market for another big acquisition. And Procter & Gamble, if the rumor is correct, um, was by about $5 billion out on, on the price. So when we look at the leaderboard, uh, we saw for Pfizer, we saw three companies that were named as potential buyers. None of them, as far as we know, has bought the business, but who knows? You may read this afternoon that the deal has gone through. The top seven share 24% of the market, still highly fragmented, even though GSK, Bayer, Sanofi, the top three have all done a major transaction in the last three years. When we've got Europe, and now, of course, if, uh, if the sale goes through, P&G and Merck between them, will move substantially up the leaderboard, and that will be uh, extremely good for, presumably, the shareholders of Merck and the marketeers at uh, Procter & Gamble, Tabor. But as always, and those of you who've been to the conferences and workshops know that we are consistently reminding the industry that growth is not normally to be found amongst the top players. It's to be found amongst the mid-tier and local players, and this is the list of the, of the 10 fastest growing, uh, or I think it's more than 10, Fastest growing companies in the OTC market over the last 10 years based on a five-year compound annual growth rate. It's interesting to see that there are companies that are in the list every year. It's interesting to see in Latin America the Roma's company coming in to the market because of a very broad expansion into all the markets of Latin America and now is the third fastest growing company heavily investing behind its brands, particularly in Brazil. Um, we're seeing Sanpen from Japan a company that we don't normally think about as a top player, coming into the international eye care market, um, along with a number of other top players in eye care, um, with premium products, preservative-free, a lot of ethical support. We'll see more of that in a moment. And the two I put in red are two um, Western companies, in, in a sense. Uh, eye Health is certainly uh, a Western company. We have three colleagues from Eye Health. That's a division of DSM, the Dutch Swiss raw material supplier, and is consistently in, in the international leaderboard because of the great work that it does on Culturel, the, um, the, the leading global, uh, by one definition, the leading uh, global probiotic. Another definition, if you bring in internet and e-commerce, then the people at Procter & Gamble say a line is bigger, so the jury is out, and then uh, Sanofi thinks Enterogemina is the biggest, but of course that's a registered OTC, and practically in one country, only Italy. And we, have, and, and we then have this, the wonderful Swiss company, which is neither Swiss nor Australian now, because it was bought by, uh, by the Chinese, but is certainly the number one multivitamin in Australia. And through what we call the suitcase trade, where students and tourists literally fill up suitcases with the brand, take them back to China, and sell on the equivalent of eBay, it's becoming a very big brand in, Austra in China, and in fact, the Chinese company that's called Health and Happiness, wonderful name for a company, has bought them. So this is where we look for growth. Now, what happens in Europe? Now, the first thing we have to say is that despite the growth in the value of the market, the underlying trend in region Europe, including Russia, is negative. For the last five years, volume sales are down at about 1% a year, and that's a big worry for an audience like this. Um, so although we see figures like, here's region Europe, growth has, has fallen to 2.7%, it was previously 47 If you take out Russia, the numbers are a little bit lower because Russian, Russia has a higher growth, not as good as it used to be, but it has a high growth compared with um, the rest of Europe, 
Nevertheless, we're looking at 2.2% value growth last year, constant currencies, but the fact of the matter is volume is down. And then when we also think of this major global trend towards prevention, so here are the categories, the fastest growing categories, not in terms of size, but in level of growth. In 2017, the ones in red are prevention, the ones are in black are treatment or intervention, these are global figures. It's slightly less towards prevention in Europe, which is more of a treatment market. So here we have a low growth market trending towards prevention, and yet we find some astonishing brand growth case studies. So the reason I was up at three o'clock this morning was I wanted to show some of these to you. So here's an interesting fact. There are 200 brands in region Europe that have sales of over 23 million euros. Now, why 23 million? Well, it's, I wanted to bring 200 in. So the, it's the 200 I wanted to show. Of those, 14 brands had more than 20% annual growth rate, and these are brands with scale. We're not talking a brand that grows from 1 million to 2 million. We're talking about brands that have grown from at least 23 million to a much bigger level. So let's just pick out a few of those brands. Grantus from Aboka, a natural cough remedy, 48 million euros. It's grown at 20% a year on average for the last five years. Snoop from Stade, a 360 degree relaunch, $39 million of sales, 20% annual growth over the last four years on average. Bronco Stop. And we have colleagues here from Quizder and from Perigo. A, a, a cough remedy that's for both wet and dry cough, $28 million of sales, growing at 47% a year on average for the last five years. Those three are treatments in a market that is moving to prevention. Now we have another treatment, which is a dry eye remedy called Theolo's Duo from the Taya Company. This is a brand that's grown at 49% a year to 43 million euros, entirely by professional recommendation. I know that because my optician recommends it. It's preservative free. This is the one she said you should use even though the other brands are my clients and this isn't, so I of course want to use my client brands, but this is the one my optician recommends. In every country, this is one of the most professionally, highly professionally recommended brands. Now you'll remember those of you last year that, that when we voted for the new product of the year, you voted for Omni Biotech, Biotech's Hetox brand, a probiotic for liver treatment. That range of products are from Allergosan, because of its segmentation, because of its finding of new indications, is a 41 million euro brand that's been growing at 40% on average every year for the last five years. We can find growth in treatment, in prevention, in old categories and new categories. And the mummy and daddy of them all, of course, is Voltaren. Ethical heritage, consumer engagement, sensible new product development. This brand is the number one OTC in Europe. Sales of 570 million, 11% annual growth rate. That is astonishing. Congratulations to the Novartis team and now the GSK team for consistently making this a uh, global brand, but here I'm just looking at the region Europe figures, making this such a success, and they're not even in the US with it at the moment. So we have good examples of how to grow even in a flat market, but we do have to increase the pace. We've got to get a move on if we're going to get the rewards. So I want to introduce you, to you a concept called pace, and we need to follow the four elements of pace. And during the course of the next uh, few minutes, we're going to illustrate, explain, and encourage you to follow pace and to increase your pace. We have to move faster. First of all, our friends in pharmacy. Pharmacy is still the bedrock of the OTC retail market. I wish we had the data to tell you what e-commerce and multi-level is, we don't yet. We hope we will in the future. We do, not, we do not, as a company, have that. I don't believe anybody has that data at the moment. So pharmacy and retail consumer healthcare is 80% of revenue 
outside of the United States. If you add in the United States, it's about 70% of, of, of revenue. And no surprise here, I've shown these slides before. Pharmacy point of care. Pharmacy point of care is turning highly trained, valued pharmacists into ambassadors for consumer healthcare, self-medication, and hopefully our brands, encouraging pharmacists to give in pharmacy diagnosis. And we are seeing in certain countries more and more power giving to the pharmacist under, under training with certification to be able to diagnose conditions like strep throat, erectile dysfunction, sexually transmitted disease, and the like. Secondly is adjacency. Adjacency is reaching beyond the six categories of consumer healthcare, pain, cough, cold, GI, dermatologicals, vitamins, and lifestyle. And to see where we can build a business based on reaching out into adjacent categories. Now, my very good colleague, uh, Ekaterina Pantaleva, who's chief operating officer of our con global consultancy division, is now going to tell us some good examples from adjacencies. with the fastest growing categories and you could see that probiotics is the fastest growing category globally and it started as a adjacent category and now it's you know one of the core categories with scale so when we were looking at possible at the categories which could become core categories in the future one of the categories as an example that stands out is diabetes and if we consider what's happening currently in the category, um, we do see that marketeers are interested in the category and that there are developers of the products in the area. And could this category become a core category in the future? Possibly. And because there are um, the number of patients in the category is significant, over 422 million people globally, patients globally, and the number of patients in pre-diabetes is also growing. And if we look at how the category is structured in OTC and consumer healthcare space, what we see is that there is a possibility to split the category into the products for prevention of type 2 diabetes and the products that address the symptoms, help to manage the symptoms, and overall improve the quality of life. So if we look at the prevention area um, in diabetes um, care, we do see the cluster which we call metabolic reconditioning cluster in weight management and glucose metabolism. And then there are products that support patients in managing the symptoms, and we do see the products for glycemic control. There is a range of products for skin health, the products that help to relieve dry skin, cracked skin, and especially food care. Um, and then there is a range of products that address symptoms that come along with type 2 diabetes, products for eye health, products for pain relief, heart health and overall healthy aging. And these products would be specifically um, positioned for patients with um, diabetes. And that's, you know, that's quite interesting to see that in consumer healthcare space, we do see the products that support patients in obviously serious medical conditions. Will we see more of that in future as you know, the core category um, in consumer healthcare? Now, looking at what's happening in the category globally currently, what we see is a range of products in skincare, and then there are products which are promoted by specialist brands. And at the same time, we do see that multinational companies are playing in the category. And uh, there was a, a, wish, a, a product which does seem quite interesting in the pain relief space. A, a technology, a wearable technology that uses nerve stimulation to provide pain relief. And we see more and more products coming to the market. Now, there's obviously a huge range of food supplements in diabetes care. And 
we, you know, there are a lot of products in the States and globally. And um, again, an example that proves the point that multinational companies are still interested in the category is the product under Meta brand, a food supplement for daily blood sugar support. And another example from Australia, this is a range by Sanofi under Glycemix brand. So what we see there is that there is a whole range of products under umbrella branding, and this brand covers pretty much all of the categories within diabetes care, diabetes care. We do see the products for food care, heart health, glucose metabolism, eye care, food care, and skin care. So obviously, you know, an umbrella branding covering um, a, a range of symptoms um, and a range of products that are to support the patient, to improve the quality of life, and to actually, uh, you know, reduce um, the symptoms um, as much as possible. So that's what we see already happening in this category within the consumer healthcare space. Now, then when we were looking further at non-core categories at consumer healthcare, um, at Nikos Hall Company, we have the tool which is called uh, OTC New Product Tracker. And there we track new product launches globally. And we have the ranking system uh, um, uh, from a four-star ranking system. And on the slide, you can see an example, the product that has a four um, um, innovations of ranking. This is product by Danone Sudinade. So this is now the example of the product that would offer the, um, the, not the solution, but the support to the patients with serious medical conditions. So this is a dietary management of Alzheimer's at early stages. It's um, sold in a range of countries and in UK, for example, has a status of food for special medical purposes. Uh, 85 pounds for 24 bottles and the patient needs one bottle per day. And uh, they have a, a you know, whole program uh, explaining how carers can support um, um, you know, their relatives and how this product actually supports um, patients with, with Alzheimer's. And then looking further, a recent launch in the States. Uh, this is a, a home, um, the, a screener for at home usage to uh, screen the, the hearing, and they claim to be the first and only FDA cleared home test for hearing screen. Um, it's called I Hear Test, and it has three out of four stars for innovation. And then when we look at what's happening in devices market, this is an example, a product launch in 2017 by Nokia. And obviously, Nokia is looking for the pathways to diversify their business and are looking at consumer healthcare. So they've launched this sensor to monitor sleeping patterns, heart rate, and snoring. And what they also offer is the program for personalized coaching. So based on what they receive and monitor, they can actually recommend how to improve uh, overall health and how to reduce fatigue. And Nokia here is following some examples already existing on the market. It's interesting to see that the companies that were not in consumer healthcare are entering the consumer healthcare in, uh, in different categories. And this product also has three out of four stars for innovations. Now, this example, not exactly the adjacent category, uh, but uh, this is the product by my previous employer, Mars, a FMCG company. So what they've done, uh, several years ago, they launched a range of products, coca extract, um, in the States. And in 2017, they launched a range of products in UK. So this is food supplement, and what they say is that they have a patented process for extracting cocoa flavanols, 
and they claim to have good science behind the products, that they know how to extract co cocoa flower oils from fresh cocoa beans. So interesting to see that FMCG players would consider consumer healthcare industry as you know the industry to look at because everyone is looking for possible adjacencies, exploring new industries, and obviously bringing more competition um, to um, classic marketeers, which is good, more competition, more innovation. And this product, Cocovia, also has three out of four stars for innovation. And may I just say that innovations and search for innovations is one of our core competences at Nicholas Hull Consultancy, along with the projects on market, on market entry, category entry, mergers and acquisitions, future proofing, and positioning. And on your tables, you have the brochure, which does um, um, explain what Nicholas Hall Consultancy five by five pathways to success is. And I'll be happy to talk to you during the conference or after the conference on how consultancy could support your businesses. And now over to Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you, Katya. So thank you, Katya, for sharing those adjacencies, uh, categories that have happened or are about to happen or can be extended. So welcome back, Mo, who's setting a very exciting pace for us. Uh, and we've seen pharmacy, we've seen adjacency. We're going to talk now about the consumer. Uh, First of all, we need to get the demographics right. We need, we need to target the, those special groups either because of their size, their growth rate, their special needs, and you will know that here at this company we are very, very passionate about products for women, products for the older consumer, uh, and the proof is in the numbers. So Sanofi, inheriting from Bering Ingelheim, a wonderful product called Eve, in a totally flat pain relief market, this is a brand growing at 9% a year because it is specifically targeted at women using a famous word, not using the Japanese symbols, but using a well-known word in the, in the English Western script. It's proved that it can work. Now, engaging with the consumer at point of sale is very important. And at this point, I'm going to call up Luca Pagana, who's the chief executive of a company called Be My Eye. I have to say, I had not heard of this company until about a month ago, I'm very excited and I've invited Luca to come in and talk to us about how his company can help engage with the consumer at point of sale. So, Luca, welcome and... Hello. You Thank have the you next 20 minutes. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Well, first of all, it's an honor and a privilege to be uh, standing next to such an inspiring and successful leader. And to thank you, Nicholas, for... Uh, the kind invitation to your event. I wanted to um, bring you a small, yet very significant uh, gift, uh, which uh, I think is quite uh, uh, relevant given the context of your keynote. It's all about growth, and uh, growth is really what we're gonna talk about during this next uh, 20 minutes. The significance of this book uh, is in that it disavows completely the commonly accepted wisdom that in order to grow, brands must focus on their loyal customers based on the assumption that it's easier, cheaper, and more effective to do so than to acquire new ones. What the author of this book, uh, Byron Sharp, uh, has demonstrated through years of research conducted together with the uh, Edinburgh Bass uh, Institute is that brands that have consistently outperform competition in terms of growth are the ones that have been reaching the highest levels of market penetration by mastering two key areas of their business. Clearly, mental availability, which refers to the probability of your brand to be thought of, remembered, or even recognized at the crucial point of purchase. But mental availability says Byron Sharp, is nothing unless you are able to master the physical availability. Unless you're able to make sure that your product is where it needs to be, when it needs to be. Or in other words, as an executive at Unilever said to me last week, if my product is not on the shelf, my product doesn't exist. Sounds simple, 
Not easy. 20 years ago, as long as you were able to monitor the large supermarket and hypermarket chains, you were pretty much in control of your distribution. But our habits have changed. How many of you remember the last time you've been in a big shopping center doing a large three hours, four hour shopping trip, coming back home full of bugs? Well, it's the last thing I would do with my own time. I've got the internet. But also, there's an interesting research that came out recently from uh, McKinsey showing that our houses are smaller, so we don't stock up as much as we used to do. We don't have enough, enough uh, storage space. We are much more waste conscious. Women are working, so there isn't somebody in the household that has the time every day to do the shopping. And all of these social changes have had a dramatic impact on the retail landscape, which means that today, 70% of our shopping trips that we carry out during the course of a week happen to be in what we call dark channels, i.e. those segments of retail where there is no visibility whatsoever in terms of what's happening in the store. Does that sound familiar? Well, it should, because when it comes to consumer healthcare, you can't think about a more fragmented and challenging market in terms of retail to be able to track. This is what we call the last two centimeter challenge. How do you actually ensure that your product is where it needs to be, where it needs to be? In order to explain how powerful this concept of the last two centimeters is, I'm gonna show you a small video, please. The final of the men's Coxless Falls is underway. Good luck, Great Britain. We're with you every single stroke of the way. Italy in one, Australia in two, Great Britain in three, Canada, the world champions, are in four, New Zealand in five, Poland are closest to us, and Great Britain have just stalled out in lane number three, and Great Britain are leading, but only, only just. Two feet up on Canada, because there's nothing in it. It's less than a foot. It's about two or three inches. Great Britain lead Canada at the halfway mark of the final of the men's heavyweight Coxless Force. The Canadian crowd are roaring because Canada now have started the long wind in to the finish. Now here we go, 500 down. Great Britain are in lane number three. They are the defending Olympic champions, but they are being led by Canada. Great Britain are coming up level. Matthew Pinson has taken Great Britain through. Now just two feet up on it. Canada have no response. The Italians up in lane number one. This is the pain part of the race. The legs hurt, the arms hurt. The whole thing is just going to be going black for them. At this stage, though, Olympic gold medalists are made. And Great Britain are stepping up to the challenge. Did anyone think that Italy would win? <laughs> I'm not that partisan. In fact, I apologize, I was looking for a more mainstream uh, type sport, but I've been told that the last time England won the World Cup, television hadn't been invented yet. So I had to revert back to rowing. Uh, jokes apart, two centimeters, four years of preparation, 2,000 meters, and what made the ultimate difference between gold and silver is those two centimeters. When Stephen Williams was asked how did he manage to win the gold medal for the second time in a row, he said that the four years of preparation, they knew the Canadians were just as good as them, if not better than them. So they knew that the whole race would be decided with the last two strokes. And we find a lot of analogies and similarities between this and what happens in general, in consumer goods, but imagine in uh, consumer healthcare. 
how many years before launching a new product in research? Consumer insights, how much money spent in marketing? All of these efforts wasted if you cannot master your physical availability, if you can ensure that your product is actually there when people actually want to go and buy it. So this is why BMI exists. As I said, the inspiration behind the creation of a company like BMI stems from the fact that ultimately, if you're not able to master those last two centimeters, you're gonna have a lot of troubles in finding growth. So today we help hundreds of consumer brands perfecting their in-store execution across 19 territories all over Europe, all the way to Russia, by allowing them to monitor their, uh, the execution across hundreds of thousands of stores so that they can ultimately reach that perfect store image that they so much crave. How do we do it? Well, that's where the disruption comes in. We bypass traditional market research or field activities by connecting brands that need information from specific locations with people that happen to be in those locations already. These people have a smartphone, typically. They have downloaded our app. We call these people our eyes. We publish within our app. Imagine our app is like a game. We publish missions. A mission consists of going into a pharmacy, going to a supermarket, into a consumer electronics store, taking pictures, finding a product, scanning a barcode or a combination of all of the above. When the mission is completed, every one of these missions is validated. And if the mission has been successfully accomplished, the eye gets paid. So it's like a game in the real world. It just happens to produce real money as a payout. Now, the disruptive nature of crowdsourcing has been defined in literature as an exponential technology is that it allows us to provide data with unprecedented levels of speed, granularity, scale, reliability, at a fraction of a cost. And I want to show you a, what I love as our most uh, impressive uh, case studies, which conveniently is not showing the picture, but in a way, let's say it's because we don't want to talk about the brand who's involved, but the brand is selling razor blades. They've discovered that they sell 40% of their razor blades between 4 and 8 p.m. on Friday afternoons in the UK. So obviously, boys like to get nicely trimmed before uh, they go out for the weekend. Now, this brand is absolutely obsessed with on-shelf availability. In fact, the name of the program is NEE. -E. Never, ever, ever should I be out of stock during those four hours on a Friday. So what we do for this brand, we monitor over 1,000 supermarkets, Boots, Asda, Sainsbury's, Tesco, you name it, Superdrug, in those four hour slot, and we provide them real time data about their on shelf availability by store so that they can action by store. And as you can see, throughout the years, they've been able to improve, to increase their on shelf availability by a staggering 10%. So you can imagine how in uh, consumer healthcare, this could be applied uh, to seasonal products, uh, flu, uh, hay fever, where you really need to make sure that when the season starts and hits, your product is definitely where it needs to be. So when it comes to consumer healthcare, of course, we have a lot of experience. We've been uh, uh, working with uh, several brands across many territories, to monitor the display distribution and detailing uh, uh, activities uh, in stores. And the results have been consistently very disappointing, but it's normal. It's a very, very challenging segment. But when you talk about gaps between the expected in-store execution and the reality of up to 90%, that's hardly a picture of success. So how have the most successful brands that we work with been able to address this challenge? Well, first of all, segmentation. It is impossible to monitor on a weekly basis or even on a monthly basis, tens and thousands of pharmacies. And now with the uh, liberalization in more markets, you will start seeing most of your products happening to be present in convenience stores, uh, even in supermarkets for some, uh, some of them. So 
the level of challenge, in fact, is increasing, but so is the level of opportunity. So what these brands do, they use our crowd to segment the retail segment, the retail ch channel that they're targeting, by collecting the structural criteria, the structural variables that enable them to identify the high potential parts of the segment. So imagine a very basic segmentation between gold, uh, silver, and bronze, which they then use in order to uh, identify to structure a program of tracking across their uh, uh, perfect store essentials, which can vary in intensity and frequency depending on the type of segment they're addressing. Okay, so again, uh, promotion compliance, uh, brand recommendation, as well as uh, obviously assortment compliance. Crucially, we're not substituting field forces. In fact, we're providing fuel for the field forces to operate on a much more effective basis. So what brands do, they use our data to direct the field forces where their action will be most effective and crucially, not use them for low value add activities, i.e. collecting data, but for what they're meant to do in the first place, i.e. sell. <coughs> All of this, as you would expect, results in uh, significant, sometimes unexpected improvements in retail performance, up to 10%, 20% increase in brand recommendation levels, uh, uh, compliance in terms of promotion, which if you believe that in-store execution has an impact on your growth, and I'm forced to think that you believe that because of the sheer amount of money that is invested in perfect store programs which take different names, feature of success, the moment of truth, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got to have a link in your mind that if the in-store execution is as you would like it to be, then sales will happen. Well, if that's the case, then really you should focus on the last two centimeters because that's where your perfect store will happen and that's where your growth will come from. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Fantastic. Oh, thank you, thank you. I look forward to reading that. Thank you, Luca. That was um, very exciting. Crowdsourcing is uh, a new a new tool for the industry and. Uh, it was interesting to see, uh, to hear Luca's presentation and uh, our company is doing some work with other companies working in crowdsourcing in the United States. So more about that next year. <clears throat> so moving on, here's Mo back telling us that we've got to increase the pace and we've just been given a wonderful tool with which to do it. We've talked about the pharmacy, we've talked about adjacencies, we've talked about the consumer, engaging with the consumer at point of sale. Yesterday was a wonderful workshop organized by Steve Sowerby and Trevor Gore with uh, a group of about 50 individuals looking again at engaging with the consumer. Um, our academy continues. We launched two years ago and it continues to be very successful, way beyond expectation. Addressing issues like winning in pharmacy, 360 degree marketing, and engaging with the consumer. And the E of PACE is e-commerce and more engagement with the consumer. So for example, um, just a, just a single slide here because we're not going to talk specifically about e-commerce and internet marketing. That probably needs to be a conference in its own right, although we do have speakers on that topic here, but it isn't the whole topic for this conference, but as I say, it would be worthy of uh, a future meeting. The issue with e-commerce is who will own it? Will it be big tech? Will it be brand owners? Will it be a combination of both? Everyone in this room who's uh, managing a brand will have an app but e-commerce has gone way beyond apps. And we're beginning to see some disruptive players, such as Amazon, such as Google, entering this market, joint ventures with pharma companies, some with OTC companies. We're seeing Amazon, for example, with the new joint venture with Perigo, which is uh, helping Amazon to put an extremely successful line of uh, own brands into the marketplace using its, its consumer platform and its huge reputation. But E is also engagement with the consumer, and this is where we start the awards process by showing you the show reel for the Collingball Creative Awards, and that's going to be uh, introduced by 
My colleague Katya. So every year we give an award for the most creative advertisement in the industry, the Collingborg Creative Award. And in a moment we will show you shortlisted nominees. And we will show most of the advertisements twice, except for the Sudocream advertisement because that's an internet video which lasts for a couple of minutes. So we'll show most of the ads twice, and then after that, we will ask you to vote for the ads that you are mostly impressed by. And in your delegates pack, you have voting forms, and you have translation there. And we will ask you to score only your top three choices, three points for your first choice, two points for your second choice, and one point for your third choice. So here are the nominees for the Collingborg Creative Award. Baksana, her 10 kişiden 9'unda D vitamini eksikliği var. D vitamini ihtiyacınız için her gün bir fıs Wellcare Vitamin D3 yeter. Wellcare Vitamin D3 ile sen de iyi yaşa. Problems with breathing feel like you're underwater. Vic Sinex is the solution. Vic Sinex unblocks the nose in five minutes up to 12 hours. Ooh. Bring you back medicine. Historias de las cinco gotas. Cinco horas al día. Cinco días a la semana. Cinco semanas seguidas. Y cinco gotas. Reuter y gotas. Silencio. Duerme. Für alle, die seit Jahren an Heuschnupfen leiden. Die so lange die Natur nicht genießen konnten. Es ist Zeit, etwas zu ändern. Mometa Hexal Heuschnupfenspray. Besonders wirkt stark nur einmal täglich. Langzeitverträglich. Macht nicht müde. Genießen Sie die neue Freiheit. Mometa Hexal, das blaue Power Energy Spray. Die Nummer 1. Jetzt rezeptfrei. Zu Risiken und Nebenwirkungen lesen Sie die Packungsbeilage und fragen Sie Ihren Arzt oder Apotheker.
Sana. Her 10 kişiden 9'unda D vitamini eksikliği var. D vitamini ihtiyacınız için her gün bir fıs Wellcare vitamin D3 yeter. Wellcare vitamin D3 ile sen de iyi yaşa. Problems with breathing feel like you're underwater. Vixinex is the solution. Vixinex unblocks the nose in five minutes up to 12 hours. Bring you back medicine. Historias de las cinco gotas. Cinco horas al día. Cinco días a la semana. Cinco semanas seguidas. Y cinco gotas. Reuter y gotas. Silencio. Duerme. Für alle, die seit Jahren an Heuschnupfen leiden. Die so lange die Natur nicht genießen konnten. Es ist Zeit, etwas zu ändern. Mometa Hexal Heuschnupfenspray. Besonders wirkt stark nur einmal täglich. Langzeitverträglich. Macht nicht müde. Genießen Sie die neue Freiheit. Mometa Hexal, das blaue Power Energy Spray. Die Nummer 1. Jetzt rezeptfrei. Zu Risiken und Nebenwirkungen lesen Sie die Packungsbeilage und fragen Sie Ihren Arzt oder Apotheker.
So it's three points for your first choice, two points for your second choice, and one point for your third choice. And we will announce the winner during the dinner tonight. And if you think that your company has more creative TV campaigns, advertisements, on, or we will have more creative advertisements this year, please apply for the next year award. So as we come to the, uh, to the end of this um, keynote speech with much diversity and different, uh, different points of view and different topics, we haven't used the word innovation yet. Where does innovation feature in this? Because in the past, it's been the whole conference. Well, we're not forgetting innovation because innovation, of course, should go throughout the marketing process. It's all of these things, segmentation, portfolio, pricing, Communications, we've just seen some uh, TV commercials and a very long video uh, commercial. Distribution, Salesforce strategy, geographies and total business models. But of course, when we think about innovation, typically we think about products and we think about new ingredients, we think about prescription to OTC switch, delivery systems and adjacencies. And that's been at the heart of the work that we do. Uh, it's part of our five by five pathways to success. And a little later on, Paul Frauendorfer and his colleagues from Compass Healthcare will be talking about a new uh, entity within consumer healthcare called the Innovation Connection, in which we try to match the needs of consumers with the aspirations of marketers uh, and the entrepreneurship of individuals and companies who invent new products and systems, and our role is joining up the dots. But you'll hear about that from Paul and colleagues a little later on. So, back to the beginning. A year ago, we said, are we looking in the right place? The answer is we are not. We do need to. The process starts. So let's start looking in the right place. Let's go beyond pharmacy, even though it's part of the pace that we have to set. We do have to look beyond pharmacy as well as making more of pharmacy to redefine the market. We think the market is already 50% bigger. Of course, it includes multi-level and e-commerce. It, growing at a rate of 5.5% in US dollars, it will be 300 billion in 10 years' time. But with the new paradigm, including the various topics that we started to present to you this morning, if we can get the pace up, it can grow by 10% a year and become 300 billion or approximately 270 billion euros. So we really do need to crack on in the way that Mo Farah was when he was uh, competing in the 5,000 and 10,000 meters. Of course, now he's a marathon runner, so the pace might be a bit slower. Um, so are we ready to increase the pace? I think we are. I think this industry is hungry for growth. We do need to increase the speed of activity and the certainty of success. So we're ready for change. We're ready for the, for the faster pace. We ho hope you are too. That's the underlying theme of this conference. Uh, and I'm now going to pass back to Nina, who's going to introduce the speakers. Because of live streaming, um, we're not taking Q&A, but I should, of course, thank the, the millions of people around the world who've tuned in this morning for the live streaming. We'll be getting their feedback electronically, just as we get your feedback in the, in the evaluation forms that you have in front of you. Um, so no Q&A, but we are around for the rest of the two days, and I pass the meeting back to our chairman, Nina. Thank you. Thank you to Nicholas, to Katia, and to Luca. Um, that was very much a, you know, a composite 